Good morning, good morning. Thank you so much for joining me. This is the lovely podcast, The Endurance of Labor Laws. I am your lovely host, Leslie Sullivan, and today is episode 55, and today we're going to take a look at the News Guild CWA. Now, it has merged into the Communications Workers of America, but originally it was the News Guild just all on its own. But first of all, I want to give a big shout out to my listeners, so let me go to my list here because you guys are awesome. I greatly appreciate you. So here we go. A big shout out to New York, Virginia, Texas, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, Oregon, and Connecticut. Awesome. I, you know, in regards to Connecticut, I don't think I've ever been to Connecticut. I, we might have driven through when we were on our way to Canada, but I think that would be a really neat place to visit because I've heard that it's lush and green, but I just don't remember actually visiting there because, you know, unless we drove through it when we were on our way to Canada, but I was way young and I was probably asleep. in the back as as little kids are but i want to do a little bit of housekeeping here and kind of just oh, how do i word this um well i kind of had i don't know if you call it an epiphany or a um i don't know a religious moment i don't know how else you you call it but um i i was watching a video and it's from this church and uh, online and they are based out of Texas and what i really like about this church is that they talk about um dedicating the the first 10% of your days of the year to god you know it's kind of like a devotional so i was like okay that's really neat i've never heard of that because i love to tithe so okay i can do that so i kind of formed my own little devotional here at home and right now we're kind of snowbound in Oklahoma because of the really crazy weather that hit last couple of days. And so I've been working from home. So I thought, well, you know, when I'm not writing or working or whatever the case may be, you know, I can definitely do some of these devotionals and just kind of go where, you know, the Holy Spirit is guiding me. So I was watching this one video of this pastor and he's really good. And um he was talking about how the devil will use anything that you have going on in your life and use it as a way to lead you astray basically don't let the devil get a foothold on anything in your life because you, if you open that door just a little bit whether it's pain suffering fear doubt worry anger whatever the case may be if you just have a little sliver of your door open to that and you haven't resolved it or you haven't given it to God that's how the devil can worm his way in and cause you to be bitter and to doubt God and all those horrible things that we're not supposed to do if you're walking the Christian faith walk so when i was watching this uh sermon it really hit me that i am not completely over what happened to me in the catholic church and it really bothered me cuz it's one of those things where i left the catholic church for a reason for many reasons it wasn't just up oh, one day i'm i'm going to leave the church there were many reasons why and i made a list of them and i thought you know i think it's good to be up front and honest with people and what i loved about watching this video is that it really helped me to take stock of you know yes i have forgiven these people that hurt me that hurt me horribly really bad. I mean, I had some very traumatic events that happened to me within the Catholic Church and I left. Um, but it's one of those things like I forgive them, but I still felt like I'm bitter and I don't want to be bitter. I'm not naturally a bitter person. I mean, I'm naturally vocal, of course, but I'm not naturally a bitter person. I'm actually normally a very happy person. I'm usually uplifting and normally I very much enjoy my life but there I realized that when I was talking about the Catholic Church the other day that I'm not completely over what happened to me and I I'm just not completely over it and that really bugged me and I thought you know it's time that that door closed and the only individual that can close that is Jesus Christ literally he is the only one that can heal my heart of that pain Because I have moved on, I have since moved on and gone to a different church. I'm around um, very kind people, and that's not to say there are not good people in the Catholic Church. I know some people that that are still Catholic. Some are cradle Catholics. Some are converts, like I was, and they're good people. But you know, the good people to me do not outweigh the bad. 
Like if you're continuing to have problems, it's like, you know, I, I have to walk away from something that something's telling me to go elsewhere. So just FYI, I know good people in almost every faith walk. I've met good people that even don't go to church. I've met really kind atheists and agnostics. Like I've met good people from every walk of life. But in regards to my personal faith journey, I noticed that I was not growing very much in my faith in the Catholic Church, especially for like the last oh gosh, 5 or 6 years, maybe a little bit longer than that. And I just thought, well, you know, I I I'm I'm very much I don't like to give up. So I thought, well, am I not enjoying my faith because you know, yes, some stuff happened. There were some very traumatic events, but you know, do do I need to you know, stand firm. Basically, you know, fight the good fight of faith. And then, you know, I finally took it up with God, and I should have been going to him with everything. But um I was shamed, I was blamed. And there were certain things I was like, well, I'll pray about it, and then there were certain things I did not want to pray about. Because number one, I didn't want to deal with it. I didn't want to deal with the shame and the blame because I was experiencing that um in the Catholic Church. And so, um when I finally just poured my heart out to God about it, I said, this is what has happened to me. And I need help with this. And he told me to leave the Catholic Church. And when I say told me, I don't mean like audible. I mean like spoke to my spirit, spoke to my heart. You need to go elsewhere. Because if something is making you uncomfortable and if there, you know, obviously we know these bad things happened and stuff is not going to change, then you need to go where you are comfortable, where you feel safe, where you can be acknowledged, where you can be loved and not mistreated. And so that's when I started looking for another church. And so I thought that well, I've moved on to another church and I've forgiven the people that hurt me. And I thought that that door was closed. I really thought it was closed. Because usually when I walk away from from something, I just literally cut ties with that. I'm like, "Okay, over it, done with it. I'm walking on, I'm moving forward. I'm not looking back." But when I was watching um this video, and it wasn't specifically a devotional. I just made it my personal devotional because I've been watching these different videos and growing in my faith while I have time at home with being snowbound. And um also just dedicating the first 10% of my year in terms of my time and devoting, you know, more prayer time. I just thought, you know, I just felt that God was calling me to really just lay my cards out on the table. Even though I thought I had already done that, I could tell that it was it was not done. It was not over with. It was not resolved. And that that's a something that was going on in my heart. And whatever is in your heart comes out of your mouth. And I thought, you know, I normally don't sound bitter or hateful. And I thought I don't want to give the devil any kind of stronghold over me because the devil's a jerk, he's a liar. And you know, if anything the devil has a stronghold on some of these people that I know in the Catholic Church. You and some people that I don't know in the Catholic Church, but I know the devil is working through them. So I made a list of some things that really bothered me about the Catholic Church. And so I just thought, well, I'll just Wipe the slate clean with this. So here are some of the reasons why I left the Catholic Church, and believe me, there were way more. But I thought, you know, this has been bugging me for years, because if I had known these things, I would have never converted to Catholicism. I thought I was converting to a really good faith, and if I had known these things, I probably, I, I just know I would not have converted. But I was blinded. And so I thought that I was converting to, you know, the original faith, and it's not the original faith because Jesus did not found the Catholic Church; he founded Christianity. So, but anyway, here are some reasons why I left the Catholic Church. So, um, number one, the priesthood. This has been from my experience. The priesthood to me is like a homosexual men's club, and that really bugged me because you have these priests that are. pretending basically to be the vicar of Christ but yet they're still living their homosexual lifestyle and then they're trying to to preach to us the congregation whether we're straight or gay or sexually confused or lgbtq whatever those other alphabets are and letters sorry I don't know all of them because I'm not familiar with all of it but to me it was very hypocritical to have homosexual men be priests 
But unfortunately, in the Catholic Church, and I can only speak for the Catholic Church, but I've heard that this has happened in other churches as well that have priests. So, but it's really rampant in the Catholic Church. So what happens is, is that um, they allow gay men to be priests because they think, well, they won't be having sex with women, so we won't be having these babies out of wedlock. And it's like, yeah, but you know, they're not eyeballing women, but they're going to be eyeballing people's kids. They're they're little boys. So the Catholic Church totally failed on that. The leadership. And it's not just recent le- leadership. I mean, this goes back several decades. Like they they wanted to hide it. And decades and decades ago, if you tried to speak up against your priest about something that happened to you, whether you're male or female, it it was like how dare you speak up about them like that? And even to this day, when the lay people try and speak up about stuff, we get our hands slapped, if not worse. So it was one of those things. I thought, you know, this is not right. I mean, men pretty much know when someone's gay. If they don't, then you know, one slipped past them, so to speak. But you know, what happens is, is they allow homosexual men to become priests, and then they put these priests. in seminaries because they they recognize oh we should not have allowed him to become a priest because he's a homosexual and he's doing really bad things to little boys so instead of um defrocking him and you know instead of doing that and reporting it to the police by the way instead of doing the right thing they're like well if he can't be in a parish because he can't be trusted in a parish we'll just put him you know at a um what do you call it a monastery or also we'll put them at these um these theology schools these seminaries well guess what they're going to be targeting seminarians these young men that may be you know 18 19 really young and they were doing horrible things to them really horrible things and one of the reasons why they would not defrock these priests was because they didn't want to admit they'd made a mistake by allowing this to happen because also they were desperate for priests because there were not as many straight guys heterosexual guys becoming priests because either a they didn't want to be a priest or b they wanted to get married they wanted to have a family so they thought that they would fill in the gap and fill in the void by by just actively recruiting pretty much anyone that will uh want to become a catholic priest and here's the thing Not all homosexual men are mean. I'm not saying that because I've actually met some really sweet ones over the years. But there's something about homosexual priests that are really mean and hateful to women. It's like it, they treat us like dirt, and I noticed that. And I thought, what in the world? And see, here's the thing: these homosexual priests, they are jealous of women because straight men are attracted to us they're not attracted to them so then they treat us like crap because of it and if you speak up about this it's how dare you say that about a priest i'm like well how dare that priest treat the women of this church like crap because we're straight and they're not like men are supposed to be attracted to women but then you have these priests some of them you know if they're gay they 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 don't want to help people get married. If anything, they sometimes discourage it. So that's targeting the the holy family of one man, one woman, you know, getting married and if they want to have kids, they'll have kids. But that's just some of the stuff that I saw in regards to that. It was creepy. And it was subtle at first. It's it's hidden. That's what I was talking about in my previous podcast. When I said there there are so many things that are hidden behind the veil or the curtain of the Catholic Church. Because there are a lot of evil people, sexually sick people, unfortunately, and I pray for them, but there are a lot of them in the Catholic Church. They they hide behind that veil of holiness. As opposed to choosing to be holy while you're wearing your veil or while you're wearing your garments or your vestments, whatever the case may be. And so once I realized more and more of what was going on, I was like, I'm not sure I can call myself a Catholic anymore if this is what it is. Cuz I did not sign up for that. 
I did not sign up for corruption. I did not sign up for hypocrisy. I did not sign up for lies. I did not sign up for allowing homosexual men to target little children, little boys, and then stuff um, get swept under the rug. I did not sign up for that, and I was like, I'm not going to tolerate that. I'm not going to. If I see something, I'll report it. But then it's like, if you dare to open your mouth, it, it's like. It, it, you know what it reminds me of? Like when you try and stand up for the right thing, it reminds me of way back in the day, hundreds of years ago, the Catholic Church, if they thought you were a heretic or if they didn't like what you said, they set you on fire. They burnt you at the stake. That's what it felt like. And if you want, if you want to read about someone that happened to, read about St. Joan of Arc. She was a young woman, and the Catholic, like she defended the Catholic faith. And she helped them win a couple of battles. Amazing soldier. Amazing. Women can fight. Women can, can fight. And this woman definitely proved it. And she's a young woman. And the Catholic Church didn't like her. When I say the Catholic Church, I mean the bishops, like these men in positions of power. They accused her of being a heretic and they set her on fire. They burned her at the stake. That's what it reminded me of when you have... lay people it's usually lay people that are speaking up and that's just that's why that's what they call people that volunteer or work in the catholic church that are not priests or nuns like they're not religious so you have people that are trying to speak up about stuff but it's like they don't want to hear it because then they'll have to actually investigate they'll have to do something and they don't want to look bad i mean no one wants to look bad but it's like you know if you caught this early Things wouldn't look so bad. It's when stuff gets swept under the rug that things start to look really bad because it's not being addressed. So going on, the next thing I didn't like, excuse me, was that to me it seemed like there were two types of priests. Um, either gay or sexually repressed straight guys who oftentimes are mama, mama's boys is what I call them. And what I mean by that in regards to the latter is that There are some straight priests. There are some guys that are straight that are priests. But it's like they're mama's boys. And what ends up happening is, I, I experienced this. There was this one priest. He was young. He was actually really good in the beginning. Like he had great homilies. I loved his homilies. I always learned something. I was like, man, he is a good priest. Then he turned on the young women in the church. Well, what happened was, my personal opinion is that he became sexually attracted to one of the young women and he turned on us. I mean, he wasn't attracted to me by any means, but I think what happened was I kind of feel like he realized he made a mistake becoming a priest because he actually wanted to get married. And so I think he made the mistake of going to uh, into the priesthood and then an article was written about him because I think he's a convert to the faith and then um It was just him and his mom growing up, I guess. And then once I read his back story, I was like, "Oh no, he's a mama's boy. Oh no, he's not going to be a good priest. He's just not. He's going to end up hating women because he was under his mom's thumb growing up the entire time. Like she never cut the apron strings basically. So then he's dealing with this internal conflict that yes, he's attracted to women, which is natural. He's supposed to be attracted to women. He's straight. That's the thing. He's supposed to be attracted to women. He's straight. So, but then he chose a vocation that forbids you from getting married. So, basically, I kind of feel like he, and mind you, we never talked about this. He would never talk to me because he ended up being a jerk, but um it's like I learned to spot these things over the years that I was Catholic. And what it seemed like to me was that once he woke up to the fact that he's a grown man, and he doesn't have to be under his mother's thumb anymore. I think he realized he made the wrong decision in becoming a priest and he actually could have met a wonderful woman and got married and had a family. Cuz there's nothing wrong with being sexually attracted to someone. God made us that way. But it has to be done in a holy and pure way. See, whenever you take sex out of marriage, it degrades it. So, but unfortunately for some of these priests, when they're 
mama's boys and it's even worse when they're a gay mama's boy. This guy was not gay, but when you have a gay mama's boy, it's a whole different oh man, it's a whole different mess of craziness. They are completely dysfunctional. They're hateful to women. So, it was very rare to meet a priest that was normal. Because you either had these these gay priests that didn't care at all to hide their homosexuality. Like they were just kind of blatant about it. Could care less. And I was like, "Wow, really? Obviously the Catholic faith is not for you if you're going to be gay and a priest. Like that that's just not right." But then you had these straight guys that just sexually repressed themselves. I'm like, you know, at some point they're going to become bitter or they're, or they're going to leave the priesthood or they're going to make a mistake and it's going to look really bad. See, what what I don't like about the priesthood is that the these priests can't get married. It's okay for priests to get married. Priests got married in the Old Testament. So why wouldn't they today? Like I think sometimes the Catholic Church just gets so restrictive that it steals happiness from people's lives. And I saw that with these priests, and I thought, you know, that's really sad. Because you don't get a do-over at the end of your life. You don't you you don't get to relive anything. So you might as well live your best life and live the life that you want, not what the church wants. but what you want and if you want to draw closer to Christ then draw closer to Christ but don't don't do it in a way that is shaming and blaming yourself all the time because shaming and blaming comes from the devil it does not come from God so you had these priests that were just constantly miserable all the time and you know what they they made the people of the parish suffer because of it oh and then they had their favorites that's another thing these mama's boys that that became priests Oh my goodness. The older women or the old women of the church would just fawn over these guys. It was so disgusting. You could tell they were sexually attracted to him. And these young priests, they loved the attention of these women. They didn't care what age they were. But also, these women would give them money. That was another thing. They would pamper them with gifts or or trips or things like that. It's like that is not appropriate at all. At all. These women, these old women are basically, and I don't mean old women in a negative way, but they were just women and they were old. They were basically buying friendship from these priests. Guess what? You can't buy friendship. You can't buy loyalty. And I just found it odd that these old women like they couldn't figure out that some of these young priests were being really mean to the younger women. It's like, why would you give money to someone that's being mean to somebody else? Like it was just weird to me. It made no sense, but I was like that is corruption right there. And it is unbelievably wrong. And even though these priests have taken a vow of poverty, which I think is such a joke. Here's the thing. They would take a vow of poverty, but they still wanted money. Thievery happens all the time in the Catholic Church. There are so many scandals with misappropriation of funds, fraud, things like that. And it's it's just bad and what what really sucks about that is that whenever people are tithing they're 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 tithing usually their first 10% of their income they're giving it back to god so whenever these people are stealing the tithe which this has happened with priests and with lay people unfortunately whenever they're stealing the tithe not only are they stealing from that person that donated it or gave it or whatever they're stealing from god They're stealing from the house of God. They're stealing the temple money. Now, how evil and sick is that? They're giving themselves permission to steal from something that's not theirs, and to steal from something that's on holy ground. That really bugged me. All this stuff bugs me, but that just shocked me because I'm like, you know, stealing is wrong. thievery is wrong thievery is thievery all across the board but let me tell you this when someone is willing to steal from a church that is a whole different character flaw it is really immoral 
it, and, and they continue to do it, and they continue to give themselves permission. Well, well, I'm owed it. I took a vow of poverty. Who cares? If you don't like being poor, go get a job. Go get a job. And you know what? If being a priest isn't for you, don't be a priest anymore. Like, just because something did not work out, that doesn't mean you should shame and blame yourself. That doesn't mean that you're a failure. It means you need to do something else with your life. Like, stop living in regret. What I came across was I met a bunch of priests over and over and over again. It's like they were constantly living in regret. Constantly. And it's like, how am I supposed to have spiritual strength? How am I supposed to grow in my faith when they don't even believe in their faith? And they are a shepherd, technically. Whoever is leading your church, whether you're Catholic or not, they are your shepherd. Well, if your shepherd doesn't know what to do, I mean, what are the sheep supposed to do? Like, it's not my job to give advice to priests. But it was kind of turning into that. And it's like, that made me really uncomfortable. And I knew when to keep my mouth shut because there's some priests they don't want to hear it. They think, first of all, if you're a woman, you should keep your mouth shut. Or they think they're the priest, you're not, so therefore they have more say. It's like, no, you don't. The shepherd never degrades his sheep, but that's what was happening in the Catholic Church. They were degrading the very people they were supposed to love and protect. Let me tell you something. When a priest talks down to you and treats you like dirt, you do not feel protected. You don't feel loved whatsoever. So I wasn't experiencing the love of Christ because of that. And I thought, you know, I am a believer in Christ Jesus. When I go to church, I should feel loved. And if all, I'm, if all I am experiencing is hate, or predominantly a bunch of hate, then this isn't where I need to be. Because if I wanted to experience hate, I could easily go back to high school and deal with the clickiness of that hormonal time. But I don't want that. I want something better. Like Christ doesn't call us to be mean. He calls us to himself. He calls us to be Christ-like. And so because of that, I can recognize when someone is miserable. And it just seemed like these guys were just miserable. I'm just like, man, do a reality check. The priesthood is not the be-all in all. It's an occupation. It's what you choose. But technically God calls all of us to his holy family. Technically all of us are vicars of Christ. And that's one thing the Catholic Church did not agree with. They they hardly ever agreed with the converts. And I was just like, wow, so you guys really haven't read the Bible. Like I'd heard over the years that Catholics don't read the Bible, but when I, you know, converted to Catholicism, I realized that that saying was really true. They hardly ever read the Bible. They might read what someone else says and what someone else says and what someone else says. I'm like, why aren't we reading the Holy Word of God? Like his word is right here in front of us. We have like two to four uh, passages at almost every mass that we read, but why aren't we reading from the Bible when we're not in church? Like why are we just reading these books from people that just think they know what they're talking about? Like if you really believe in God, why don't you want to hear what he has to say about something? That was my thinking and like I even joined a Bible group. It did not go very well. <laughs> Cuz I was told it was a Bible group. So I brought my Bible. We didn't open a single Bible that entire time. We were supposed to read this book that some guy wrote and I don't even like the guy. I don't know him personally, but I've tried to read his stuff and I don't like him. He's like a die-hard Catholic and I'm like, "Oh, this is just great." You know, very extreme. and um obviously hasn't heard the feminist movement and um it's just like wow he's very uneducated but yet he's he's known as supposedly as a theologian within the catholic church i'm like really way to pat yourself on the back like the arrogance that came out of this guy so we had to read his book we had to watch his video and just like this is not what i want at all this is not a bible study this is studying someone else's work and so There were a lot of things that I did not agree with and I was like, you know what? This just isn't for me. And so the more I started backing out of different obligations within my parish, the more I realized 
you know, it's it's not just the parish and you know, we have some good parishes in in Oklahoma and Oklahoma City, but I just thought, you know, this isn't a parish problem. This is a calling of my faith issue. This is where does God want me to be? Where does God want to plant me? See, because I planted myself in the Catholic Church. God didn't put me there. I thought he wanted me to be there because I wanted to be there. I really felt that I was called to convert to Catholicism. But here's the thing, the entire time I was Catholic, I was never really treated like a Catholic. The moment someone found out I was a convert, they're like, "Oh, you're a convert. Oh, you're not a credible Catholic." So it's like the, there was like this constant division within the Catholic Church. You're either a credible Catholic or a convert, but if you're a convert, you're never really seen as an equal to a credible Catholic. So it's like you're always a second-class citizen. I just thought that is not Christ-like. Because God doesn't play favorites. He doesn't say I love you more and you less. He doesn't do that, but that's what it was like in the church. So that really bugged me with that. So I had to deal with that the entire time that I was Catholic. I was like, well, maybe I'm just around the wrong people. So I would I would church hop. I would go from one Catholic church to another. I would try and get to know new people. I would try and get to know the priests, and we do have some good priests, but they are few and far between in the Catholic Church. They really are. But um, I just got sick and tired of, of having to leave church because there was always a theology problem, there was always a religion problem, there was always a priest problem, there was always a, you know a lay person problem. There there was just always an issue that never got addressed, and it's like you know. If I can't grow my faith here, I shouldn't be here. It's not for me. And I need to walk away. And that really broke my heart because I felt like I was turning my back on God, but I wasn't. I wasn't turning my back on God. I was walking away from a religion that was I was walking away from a religion that wasn't giving me joy. It was stealing my joy. And there's only one individual that loves us to be miserable and that's Satan. That I mean that's the devil. I mean he wants you to be miserable all the days of your life. Whereas Jesus, he wants you to be joyful and happy and blessed all the days of your life. And I thought, you know, if I'm not growing in my faith here, I need to walk away. And it took a lot of guts to walk away from something that I had invested years in. And I really meant it when I converted, but I thought, you know, I just thought, well, Lord, not my will, but your will. And when I said that, it took a huge burden off of me. And I thought that by forgiving the people that hurt me and were really cruel and evil to me, I thought that, hey, I forgive them, that pain should be gone. Well, that's not always how pain works, and that's probably why I don't like pain whatsoever, especially emotional, spiritual pain, the trauma. Um I had a hard time with that. You know, it's like you think it's done over with and then like you have this horrible memory of something that happened to you. I'm like, I don't like this. I don't like having that memory. I don't like feeling like that. So I thought, well, I obviously need that get I need to give that to God. Because I've acknowledged that there are some things that are over my head. Like there're just some things I don't understand and but I know that God knows everything. He he gives me wisdom, he gives me guidance, he he gives me joy, he gives me happiness, gives me patience, he gives me a new life. And when I was practicing Catholicism, it just felt like my life was being stolen from me all the time. And it, it's just like I don't need this burden. <laughs> so the religion the religiosity was becoming a burden instead of helping me get to hell or sorry instead of help helping me to get to heaven <laughs> sorry i felt like i was going to hell when i was catholic um because they would just shame and blame it's like you could never do anything to get close to jesus it's like well if i'm doomed why do i even bother why do i even try but it's like i know i'm not doomed and i know i am worthy of going to heaven so why am i just allowing myself to be around all this negativity because whatever you are around is what you become. You know whatever you whatever you listen to is what your brain memorizes, which is why I wanted to have this new devotional for the first part of the year. The first 10% of my year. 
I thought, you know, I can donate that to God. I can do that. I can grow. Because I know what to look for. I'm going to look for positive, good things. And I didn't realize that my heart and my soul was still broken. And it desperately needed to be healed. I mean, there was a lot of pain there. But I know that God can heal that. So I'm very grateful for that pastor that that is, that is not Catholic by any means. Um has a great flourishing ministry in Texas and you know every message I have watched of his has been Bible based. It's been true to God's word. He has a good sense of humor, but you know, he really say he really says it like it is because he wants you to get to heaven. He's not there to shame you or blame you. to mistreat you. He wants you to live your best life, not your worst life. And I just felt like the longer I was Catholic, the more I was just going down a rat hole. I was like, I'm young. Like I still I still have a lot of years ahead of me. So why am I forfeiting my joy for people that could care less about me? Like why am I falling into the trap of religiosity and some theology that is not even from God, it's man-made? You know, I just I had a lot of doubts and sometimes you have to acknowledge the doubts that you have and realize, "Hey, what is pulling me away from God?" So, well, let me continue down my list. So, one of the things, another thing I didn't like about the Catholic Church is that whenever they are electing a new pope, all they are doing is voting for each other. They claim they are letting the Holy Spirit guide them. However, I seriously doubt that the Holy Spirit guided them to elect a socialist to be the current pope. Pope Francis, he is a socialist. And when he became pope, I mean, I was happy initially, but then when you read up about him, you realize where he's from, what all he has caved in on, like what he has not stood up for, and the things that come out of his mouth, you're just like, "Whoa." Because what comes out of the mouth is what's coming out of the heart. So he's got some problems there. So Pope Francis has been a socialist for a long time. He comes from a very corrupt country that is socialist, if not slightly communist. He speaks negatively about the United States and about capitalism. However, the Catholic Church loves money and so do socialists. After Pope Francis was elected, he started his personal agenda on going green in terms of environment and being an environmentalist like it wasn't long after he was elected pope i called it the honeymoon tour and he had all these press people on his his jet and he just started all this nonsense about going green and talking about the planet i'm like you have got to be kidding me like like that's your number one concern i mean yes it's important but as a shepherd you're more concerned about the planet than your sheep that you're supposed to be guiding and helping them get to heaven like my mouth dropped because then non-catholic started asking me hey have you heard what he said today i was like no but let me hear it you know it's just like rolling my eyes he's not a good shepherd why because he's a socialist he has a lot of problems and the reason why is because he has problems with greed now it may shock some people but think about it You know, not all priests take the same type of vows. The the how I word this, the seminary or the priesthood that he joined makes an extreme vow of poverty, like almost to the point of hatred of money. So of course they're not going to appreciate the United States even though they want our money. Of course they're not going to appreciate or agree with capitalism even though in capitalism you have way more freedom. and people are technically safer in a capitalistic society because corruption is way less is it perfect no but it's way less than the country he's from i think he's from argentina or one of those down in south america but he is from a very corrupt country that has an extremely high rate of abortions and very dangerous abortions but yet he kind of caved in on that Like for a while he stood up against the president of his country and then he just kind of slowly caved in. It's like really is that a good shepherd? No, he he didn't stand he didn't stand firm. He didn't fight the good fight of faith. 
And one of the things that people were complaining about in regards to uh, when Pope, Den- Pope Benedict retired was that um, they're like, we need a pope from the Americas. I'm like, oh, here we go. Here we go. It's about race. It's like, give me a break. Give me a break. So instead of really thinking about who you're electing, um, they, they elected Pope Francis – Because he's from one of the Americas, one of the countries down there. Because I guess a lot of people in the Catholic Church were sick and tired of people, not people, men, um, from European countries being elected Pope. But here's the thing. If your priests are socialists, they're not practicing the holy will of God. Because socialism wants to get rid of religion. It puts the government in charge of everything. And so does fascism and, and uh, communists. So that's why they did not elect anyone from the Americas or some of these corrupt countries for the longest time was because of that very problem. Well, now, in regards to Pope Francis, so instead of talking about saving souls, he was more concerned about the environmental social issues, not actual people. So I remember being on Twitter and I would... I was on his Twitter feed or whatever, or I would get his Twitter feed. And um, I was shocked that he, all he could talk about was social issues. He wasn't talking about the issues affecting the church. He wasn't talking about, about how Christians are being murdered, horrifically murdered in the Middle East because of Islam. And I was just like, wow, what, what is wrong with this guy? Like, he just let the title of Pope go to his head. I'm like, we have people dying, being murdered, because they're Christians. But yet, the Catholic Church isn't helping them. And I'll give an example of that. Like, here in Oklahoma, we have a, a charity. I think it's all over the United States, but it's called Catholic Charities. For the longest time, I thought Catholic Charities was great. Then a big expo was exposed about them that they were secretly bringing in Um, Muslim people from countries, I mean, they were escaping terror, yes, but they were bringing in Muslim families, helping them get asylum here, and helping them become citizens. And they were busting them in, in the twilight hours, into towns here in Oklahoma, hoping that we wouldn't figure it out. And there's some people that showed up at the bus stations and said, you can't drop them off here. We don't know who they are. We don't know if they're documented. Like, we can't confirm who they are. And they might be bringing in Sharia law. And some of them do believe in Sharia law. Well, guess what? Those people, the reason why they're leaving their countries over there is because of Sharia law and because of terrorists. So they know their, their way of life is wrong. It's bad. It's horrific. It's killing people. But yet they're coming into a really good country that doesn't practice Sharia law just so they can try and infiltrate it and start having Sharia law take place. That's what's been happening up in Michigan and some of the more northern states. They've been having what are called, um, are they called supercells? I forget what it's called. But basically what Muslims do, especially ones that completely agree with Sharia law, they bring over a family or so, or just a couple people, they plant them here in the United States, and they bring over their whole clan. Because one of the immigration laws, one of the stipulations is that once you plant someone here, then the United States supposedly has to allow in all of their family. Well, these Muslim families, they bring everybody. Not just the dog and the cat. They bring everybody. So then we've got this huge influx of people that we can't verify who they are. We can't verify if they are a danger to the United States. But unfortunately, you have the liberal left and a big segment of the Catholic Church, especially within Catholic charities, that they want to be seen as being politically correct. They want to be on their little social cause wagon. They want to toot their social cause horn and say, oh, look at, look at how we're helping people. Like this was even in the Sooner Catholic, which is one of the papers that the Catholic Church here in the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City that they write and they send out. And I was shocked that they had an entire article about a Muslim family that they brought over here. They're not even Christian. They're not even Catholic. I'm like, really? So we're bringing over Muslims that we can't confirm who they are. We can't confirm whether or not they practice Sharia law. 
But yet we have Christians and Catholic Christians that are being murdered and slaughtered and tortured over in the Middle East. But who do we bring over? We're bringing over Muslims. That is a problem. Like, I just thought the Catholic Church turned its back on Christians over there in the Middle East. We should have been getting them out because they're the ones that are being murdered. And quickly and swiftly, they are being horribly tortured and murdered over there. But yet Catholic charities and some of these other Catholic entities, they want to go along with these social causes, which is definitely, I guess, endorsed by the Pope because he's a socialist. I was just kind of like, wow, so this is where my money's been going. So I stopped donating to Catholic charities a long time ago because of that. I was like, that money is supposed to be local and it's supposed to help people here. Like we don't need to be busting in people. Like we we have homeless people that we need to help. We have elderly people that we need to help. We have veterans we need to help. Like we are not responsible for the entire planet. But that that's not how capitalism works. That's not how the church works. And of course that might shock some people, but think about like we are not supposed to just leave our brothers and sisters to die when they are practicing the same faith. But that's exactly what happened. And then when you speak up about it, it's like how dare you say that about Catholic charities? How dare you say that about the Catholic Church? Look at all the good that they do. It's like okay, I will agree with you they do do some good but that doesn't excuse the wrong and the bad that they're doing and what they are participating in. All they were doing was using this social cause to make themselves look good. And if they really were okay with it, they would not have been doing it in secret to begin with. But when they got found out, that's when they really toot their horn. Look at all the good we're doing. Look, we care. We care. I'm like, really? What about the Christians? What about the Christians? What about the people that are being murdered in their parishes over there? They can't even partake of communion. Like, why are we bringing in people that don't believe in the Son of God? They don't even acknowledge Jesus as 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 Jesus Christ of Nazareth like they they don't believe it like we need to be smart about who we're helping like you you don't bring in people that you don't know who they really are you don't bring them into your home like that you you have to practice safety that's not being mean that's not being a hypocrite even the bible talks about that you need to be careful who you let into your life you need to be careful who you trust You need to be careful who you do business with. You need to be careful who you uh, ally yourself, uh, ally your side. I can't even say whoever you side with. My apologies. Whoever you make your ally, you need to be careful about that. I was going to say whoever you align yourself with. My apologies. Sorry, my mouth is dry. Hold on, just a second. Okay, I'm back. So sorry about that. It's really dry here right now in Oklahoma because of the weather, because of the snow and ice. But another example I want to give to this. that was disappointed about Pope Francis and the Catholic Church is that whenever there was this big um to do over in the Middle East of course again the terrorists are killing people what else do they do and so the pope got involved and instead of doing this correct the correct way um he called on all of Europe to take in these Muslims that were escaping these terrorists He was putting pressure on Europe to bring these strangers into their home. I'm like, really? Can you open up the Vatican? Can you open up all those beautiful cathedrals that are there? Why don't you house them there? Why don't you house them in the luxury of marble, in the luxury of gold and silver, as opposed to pressuring people to bring in strangers into their house and putting their safety at risk? their their spouse at risk, their children at risk. Cuz we don't know really who these people are. Like they could be crying wolf and some of them were crying wolf. I don't believe I don't believe all of them were were escaping terrorism. 
Because they, they showed pictures of these people that were migrating. Most of them were young men. I'm like, where are the wives and the children? Where are the families? But it was mostly young men. I'm like, really? I find that really odd. If I was over there in Europe at that time, there's no way I would have opened up my home. I would have been like, go get a hotel. Go stay at a church. But see, here's the thing. Pope Francis... He's so socialist, he's so agenda-driven that he doesn't care about the safety of his sheep. That's what it told me when he did that. And I was so disappointed. And not only that, there were all these non-Catholics coming up to me and talking to me about it. I was like, look, I know, I get it, I don't agree with it either. Because they thought I was going to defend him. I was like, no, I was like, that's indefensible. That's not right what he said and did. There's all these beautiful cathedrals he could open up and, and bring in cots, he could bring in mattresses, he, he could house all those people. But he didn't do that. I think he maybe brought in one family or something into his little apartment house thing, which is another thing. Okay, so when Pope Francis became Pope, he did not want to live in the super nice apartment that the Pope normally lives in. He goes, oh, I don't need that, that's too rich. You know, we shouldn't live like that. So he chose this kind of mediocre, kind of lousy apartment. Well, here's the thing. He did that because he's a socialist. He hates money because he has a problem with greed. And number two, he took a vow of extreme poverty. So because of his vow that he took in the priesthood from the seminary that he attended, he's not allowed to live in luxury. But instead of just saying it like it is and saying, well, I can't live in this really nice apartment Because of my vows, I have to live over here. But no, he put it down as materialism is bad. I'm like, really? Then how do you explain the Vatican and all the paintings and all the beauty? Like, it, it's so hypocritical. And I'm like, really? Like, how can you say you hate something, but, but yet you keep asking for money? You keep asking for other people's resources. That is greed. That, that is greed right there. That he speaks so horribly about rich people. Here's the thing. He wants to be rich. But yet, he puts on that fake veil of poverty. Oh, look at me. I'm holy. Sorry, I don't believe it if what's coming out of your mouth does not reflect the goodness of God. I don't buy it. And people are like, oh, we can't say that about the Pope. I'm like, yes, you can. You have freedom of speech. And you know, if something's wrong, we're supposed to speak up. We're supposed to say something. Like, I loved Pope Benedict. He was a great pope. I wish he had never retired. He was such a good pope. And I've read a lot of his stuff. I read a lot of his, I think they're encyclical letters or whatever they're called. Just very smart. Super brilliant. I mean, I was, I'm so impressed with that man. And then you have someone that's the complete opposite of him come in after him. And, you know, I was super excited when Pope Francis became Pope, but it's like the moment he opened his mouth, I was like, wait a second, what is this? I was like, wait a second, we've got a socialist as a Pope. Like, you can't be a socialist and be a vicar of Christ. Because socialists give themselves permission to take other people's money. And the way they do it is they shame them and blame them. You don't deserve that. Rich people don't care about the poor. Look at you. You don't deserve all that wealth. Um, yes, they do deserve it. If they worked hard for it, that's how God is blessing them. So instead of being jealous of them and instead of shaming and blaming them, encourage them to continue to be a blessing to others. But don't give yourself legal permission to steal from them, whether in the church or outside the church. That was a big issue to me. And I wasn't the only one that was speaking up about it. There were a lot of Catholics that were not happy about that. Because socialism, it always leads to ruin. I just found it interesting that Pope Francis would talk so horribly about the United States, our economy, what all we have here, where I'm like, okay, your economy sucks. Your country's poor and it's corrupt. Why? Because they don't believe in freedom. They don't believe in democracy. They don't believe in the freedom of speech. They don't believe in capitalism. 
that they don't run things correctly. Their 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 banking system is corrupt. Their financial institutions are corrupt. Why? Because their government is corrupt. So I just thought, who is Pope Francis to say anything about the United States? Are we perfect? No, but we are way better off than his country. Like I just thought, you know, they made a big mistake by electing him to be pope. I just think about all the kind priests I have met from other countries. You know, not even from Europe. Do we have some good ones there? Sure, but we have some wonderful kind priests from India. I think is it Croatia? I've met some. I've met some priests from all over the world. I'm like, this is the best they can get a socialist. This is the best that they can do. But the thing is, the Catholic Church caved in to the pressures of we want a pope from the Americas. It's not about race. It's about electing the right person for the right position. He's not a good leader. There might be some people that get offended by me saying that, but you know, look at the facts. That's all I can say. Just look at the facts. I think it's very dangerous to have someone that's a socialist in a position of power. It really is because he does not understand capitalism. He doesn't understand democracy. He doesn't even agree with it. I'm like, you know, it's so interesting that he doesn't even agree with capitalism and freedom when it's like, you know, if we don't have capitalism and if we don't have democracy, then then we don't have freedom of religion. Our churches would be closed. We would not be allowed to practice anything if we did not have freedom, capitalism and democracy. But he doesn't see it that way. Because he is so narrow-minded and that's unfortunate. So I mean, I I pray for Pope Francis on this because he's got some issues. Some serious issues. And when you are in a position of power, you really shouldn't be having these kind of issues. They should have been resolved way beforehand or not even be there to begin with. Cuz all he's doing is teaching younger generations to doubt the goodness of God and to put down other people that have more. That is coveting thy neighbor's goods. That goes against the 10 commandments. His behavior endorses greed and jealousy, which is what we are not supposed to practice at all. Whether you are religious or not, even if you're secular, you're not supposed to practice that. I would think it would be obvious. But anyway, I'll go on down my list. So, I have religious figures are not supposed to go along with what the world says or the current trends just to be popular. And that's what Pope Francis did. Like when he went on his honeymoon is what I call it. He was just saying stuff to be popular. I mean, I was like, okay, so this this is probably going to last about 2 years and then the media will turn on him and they did a little bit. I was like, well, what a big surprise. This is what you get when you when you pander to people that are fickle and don't really care about you or love you. So another thing that the Catholic Church did was they did not remove or report priests that were pedophiles. This went on for decades. And we had that happen here in Oklahoma, and there was a whole bunch of stuff that came out. And I bet there's a whole lot more that needs to come out. But the thing is is that this is rampant in the Catholic Church. So whatever is happening here in Oklahoma, it is nothing compared to what happened up in the northern states, up in the northeastern states, because you have way more Catholics up there, way more Catholic churches and way more Catholic priests. They had way more scandals up there and they were way more grotesque. Also, the Catholic Church did some horrible, cruel, sick things over in Ireland. The Irish people, I feel so sorry for them. What they've been put through by these priests. But unfortunately, the Catholic Church did not do the right thing. They failed to protect the sheep over and over and over again. They protected the priest because they didn't want the priesthood to look bad. It's like, well, here's the thing. If you defrock a priest, you're not shaming or degrading the priesthood. You're actually protecting it. Because you are protecting your sheep from the wolf because you're casting out the wolf. You're saying, "Hey, You can still be Catholic, but you can't be a priest. And if anything, depending on the severity of your crime, we might have to report this to the police. But they didn't do that because 
they didn't want to admit they had made a mistake by letting in a pedophile into the priesthood. Because again, they thought, oh, if we get a bunch of homosexual priests, then we won't have heterosexual priests knocking up women. So they allowed the priesthood to be degraded. So it, it's no longer a holy priesthood. Which is really sad because it has the potential to be a holy priesthood. But if they're not going to act holy, then they can't call themselves a holy priesthood anymore. Like, If they're not a holy priesthood, then technically they're not in the line of Melchizedek. Even though they claim that they are, they are not. Because God does not tolerate sin, especially abominable sins, like really bad ones, especially towards children. Because there are different levels of sin. And you know, there's a part of me that thinks, well, what's worse? the pedophiles and what they do to these kids or the fact that you have these higher ups in the Catholic Church that turn a blind eye and they protect the priest not the child and then they allow him to do whatever he wants they what they did especially back in the 60s they had them go to therapy and they supposedly re- rehabilitated them i'm like you have got to be kidding me like how do you know what is in that person's heart you don't know here's the thing like When it comes to doing certain sins, it should be one strike you're out. That's how it should have been in the priesthood. Cuz that's how it used to be. Way, 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 way back in the day. Like when they were actually following God's law, they actually did kick out priests that were bad. Because they didn't want the people to lose hope. They didn't want people to quit the faith. Cuz it's like I don't want to go to a church where I'm surrounded by wolves. That's what it felt like. And also, it made me not enjoy going to confession. Like I love going to confession. I think it's a great sacrament, but I tell you what, you get an evil, wicked homosexual priest in there that hates women. Oh man, this one guy, he oh, he verbally went off on me and I was I, I'm I'm kneeling there. In the confessional, it's one of those where you you don't see the person's face. You you have a, a barrier or a wall or whatever. And I don't even remember what I said, but he went off on me horribly. And I I remember leaning back. I was like, oh my! I was like, I was thinking like this obviously is not about me because I don't know what he's talking about. He was so hateful to women. And so because there were some really mean priests here, what would happen was. Whenever someone would come out of the confessional and they would walk past the other people in line, people in line would ask, "Okay, which priest is in there because we want to know if or if not to go to him." And so, you know, I would just tell them who's in there. I wouldn't give my personal opinion, but they already knew who was bad and who was good. Like that's why whenever we had a bad priest at our parish, if I didn't trust him or if I knew that there was something wrong with him, I would go to a different parish to have my confession heard. because I didn't want to be in the presence of a wolf. I did not want to be in the presence of someone who was evil and wicked. And this wasn't just homosexual priests. The this also happened with straight priests that were those sexually repressed mama's boys. I mean, you talk about Debbie Downer. It was horrible. Like it got so bad, I complained to our parish priest about. It. I said, "Look, I don't know who some of these guys are. Some of them I do know them because they're in our in our archdiocese, but You know, what am I supposed to do when the confession goes really wrong and it's it's not right? It's it was a horrible experience. And he guided me through that. And he, every single time I had to complain about, my parish priest would say that should have never happened. I'm so sorry. So I would report it. But I was lucky that our parish priest at that time was a really good priest. But the thing is is we have sometimes we have these rotating priests or sometimes they fill in for somebody else. And then sometimes you don't know what's going to happen. And then that creates a trust issue between the parishioners and the priesthood. So I kept meeting all these really bad priests within our archdiocese, but yet they still want our money. And I'm like, I'm not giving you my money. So then we get this invitation to go to the seminarian dinner and they want thousands of dollars to send seminarians to these uh seminaries and I'm like, look, Why are we responsible for their education? 
They need to take out a loan or they need to get a job in order to afford going to these schools because these are private schools. Like they are horribly expensive. Like these Catholic schools, they are not broke. They make money off of people. So they they are totally ripping you a new one. If they are claiming to be poor or humble, they are not poor. They are not humble. These seminaries, oh my goodness, the arrogance, the pompousness, they love money. It is thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars to send one seminarian to seminary. Like they need to be able to afford it on their own. If they can't afford it, then guess what? You don't go or find a cheaper school to go to. So they would have these seminarian dinners to raise money for their quote-unquote education. So I'm sitting there, I'm like, you know, I don't feel comfortable giving them money. because I'm meeting more and more men that should have never been priests. So then it makes me question who are they who are they allowing and who are they recruiting at these seminaries? Cuz even some of these straight priests were just horrible to women. Horrible, evil, wicked. I'm like you've got to be kidding me. But they think they're above you because they wear the collar. Like that is such a dishonor to God. So I didn't give them my money. Eventually they stopped inviting me. I was like, "Good. I'm not offended at all." And it just really disappointed me. Because it's one of those things like you're you're part of a faith, you want to support it, but at the same time you're like, "You know, if something's not right, something's not right." Something's telling me that I need to go to God with this. Lord, where do you want me to tithe my money? Where do you want me to donate? Cuz for the longest time I used to never ask God, "Where do you want me to tithe?" And so because I was having problems with not trusting people and well, let me reword that. I I was having how do I word this? Cuz I say to have a problem trusting people, that means like it's all me, it's not me. I was uncertain about the people that were in a position of power. And I did not trust their authority. So it made me wonder what are they doing with the money and who are they picking to go to seminary and if I don't trust the priests that are priests now why would I trust any of them that come out of seminary and I'll give an example of this there was one guy that came out of seminary oh man you know, initially you think oh they're fresh out of seminary they'll, they'll be able to teach us a lot you know they must know a lot oh my goodness this guy was such a jerk his head was up in the clouds He gave himself permission to be a jerk, to be pompous, to be arrogant. He's like, "Well, I've been to seminary and you guys haven't, so you should just listen to me because I've been to seminary. You know, I'm your shepherd. You're you're the stupid sheep." That's how he treated us and talked to us. I mean, he didn't come out and say stupid, but it was pretty close to it. Like whenever he gave a homily, it was horrible. I would just roll my eyes. I'm sitting up towards the front row. I'm just like looking at him. I know he saw me. I'm like, "Here's this young punk, younger than me, fresh out of seminary." And he thinks that I'm going to listen to that kind of message, so I just start thinking of my own message in my head. Like, what would I want to hear? I would want to hear about the goodness of God. I would want to hear about how much Jesus loves me, and what's what's best for me, and to hold fast, and to don't give up. This priest, what a moron! He used his education for evil, not for good. That's another reason why I stopped donating to the, to the seminarian fund or whatever. I was like, what are they teaching them there? Cuz see, here's the thing, whenever we would hear these seminarians, like whenever they would get fresh out of seminary, they would graduate or whatever and become priests, we start figuring out some of the parishioners uh, that I was sitting next to, we would start to figure out, we could tell which seminarian had been to which seminary based on how they spoke because they were brainwashed. Not a single one of these seminarians knew how to handle the public. Now a single one of them knew how to handle a parish. They they did not know how to handle women. They did not know how to handle kids. They did not know how to handle um sexuality whatsoever, whether it was heterosexual, homosexual, like it's just like what are they training them in? What what are they teaching them? That they, they are brainwashed. It's like they shame you for anything and everything. I'm like, really like why don't you just change your name to Sadducee or or Pharisee? Cuz I mean I kid you not I could listen to a homily and I could figure out without them saying where they went to school I could tell which seminary they had attended because they have the same rhetoric the same spiel I'm going to get another drink of water hold on just one moment 
So being that I could tell where they were going to school. It's like okay, so now like I was still trying to stay Catholic, still trying to be Catholic. So I thought, well, if I donate anything, I only want it to go to this school. But when when you donate to the seminarian fund, you don't get to specify where your money's go to. The archdiocese decides that. I was like, I don't like that because there's some seminaries that I don't agree with what they are teaching our our young men, our priest. Because they're coming out crazy. And they're they're, they're hateful. It, it's so interesting. Like I met some of these seminarians before they went to seminary. They were normal, at least the ones I met. They were normal, kind, genuine young men. They come out meaner than a snake. I'm like, what in the world are they teaching them? Because it is not the holy word of God. I know that. They may carry that gospel book around the altar, but I tell you what, they are not living that gospel. And they are not preaching it because they don't believe in it. Because if because if someone is practicing hate, they don't believe the holy will of God and they don't believe in the gospel. Because the gospel is supposed to be the good news, not the bad news, the good news of Jesus Christ. And I just got sick of the negative rhetoric. I just I almost wanted to start wearing earplugs. Like I was just mostly going for the Eucharist and then and then the longer I was putting up with this, the more I realized so many Europeans don't go to church. They don't go to mass but once a year because they wanted to fulfill at least that one obligation that you have to go to mass once a year or go to confession once a year because they couldn't stand the rest of the time that they were spending there at church. I would think that would tell Europe, "Hey, maybe we've got a problem with our Catholic churches." If people don't want to go, if there's something going on. And guess what? There was stuff going on, especially in Ireland and France. There are a lot of bad things that happened to France. I mean, just think about it. if this stuff had been addressed years and years and years ago, we would have a stronger church today. But now you have people like me that left the Catholic Church. And I'm a lot happier because of it, but at the same time, it saddens me to have to say goodbye to my past. Because being Catholic is now part of my past, it's not my future. But what I've learned with God is he always gives us a new beginning. Because I know for a fact that God heard my prayers, he heard my tears, He saw every bad thing that happened to me and I'm not going to mention this here because it's not appropriate for this podcast not by any means and plus I don't want to re- relive that garbage I don't um cuz I don't want to take a chance of feeling pity or sorrow or that kind of thing when I have moved on but I know that God is a God of new beginnings and it's like if I want a new beginning I can't stay stuck in the past I have to move forward I can't stick with the old. I have to go to the new. I I have to keep pushing forward. Even though sometimes it sucks, I can't regress. I have to keep going forward. Otherwise, I'm not doing the will of my holy father if I'm just living in pity all the time and that sucks. I know what that's like. But at some point we have to acknowledge that God loves us. He doesn't want us to go through anything bad. He knows bad things happen, but we are not called to stay miserable. We have to keep pushing through our desert and get to our promised land, just like the Israelites. However long it takes, keep pushing forward. Don't pitch a tent in a hellhole valley where you're miserable. Sometimes we have to be nomadic. in our spirituality in in our in our faith journey with Christ like we have to keep moving keep going towards the prize keep going towards the victory because technically we have victory in Christ Jesus but I tell you what when I was catholic I didn't feel like I had any victories whatsoever I was shamed and blamed all the time I lost my joy I lost my happiness it was horrible I was like I just remember thinking I used to wake up looking forward to the day. And then I started not enjoying even waking up. I was like, "Oh no, another day." I mean, who wants to live that way? 
But it was over time that developed. I was like, you know what? I need to cut my ties with that because if it's not bringing me joy, there, there's a reason why. Like you're, you know, even if you're not spiritual or religious, or if you don't believe in Christ Jesus, our heart and our soul, and technically our central nervous system, knows when something's not right. Our body knows. Like we have instincts. I think sometimes we don't listen to our instinct. We don't listen to our gut when we should. We um, how do I word this? We allow something we're taught, where we are following a doctrine, we're following a theology instead of following the right way to live. And that's why I was so miserable. I technically was, I thought I was believing in Christ, but I wasn't getting to Him in the right way. I thought. Because I was being taught this way that the path to Christ is misery. Like if you get sick, it's from God. If something bad happens to you, it's from God. I'm like, I don't believe that, because that's what I was raised in. I was raised in a completely different religion, and so I kind of felt like I substituted one religion for the other. It's like, how did I fall in that trap? Well, we tend to go with what's familiar. And once I once that dawned on me, and I realized that, I thought, oh, this is why. Because I'm used to being oppressed in my faith when that's not what we're supposed to be at all. We're not supposed to be oppressed or depressed or suppressed. That is the complete opposite of the freedom of Christ. The complete opposite. But going on with my list here. I have a, they used what people tied to the church to pay victims' families either as hush money, or because they had to settle outside of court. So one of the things that really bugged me about that was, you know, I, I am very much a tither because I believe in tithing. And so one thing I noticed is that I noticed that something was telling me not to tithe, and I thought that was odd. I was like, something doesn't feel right about this tithe. Well, then it comes out in the paper and news and all this stuff and people talking that there are millions of dollars that has been paid out to victims' families because of these pedophiles that were allowed to be priests and they were allowed to stay priests. They were not defrocked and they were not reported to the police. So here's the thing: they were using our tithe money to pay people off. That is very evil and wicked because that's temple money. And that shocked me that they were doing that, and I was like, "Oh, that's why something was telling me don't tithe to this anymore." But I just wasn't really sure. I don't know how to describe it. It's like you know, I have faith, but I wasn't sure of what I was feeling in the spirit. Because I was like, "Well, I'm at church. Why wouldn't I tithe here? It's where I go to church." And finally, it dawns on me, I'm in the wrong church. I'm practicing, you know, the wrong faith for me personally. Because my tithe should not be used as hush money. Nobody's tithe should, because it belongs to God. And what's interesting is that the Catholic Church, instead of defrocking those priests and kicking them out of the priesthood, they just moved them from parish to parish, and they victimized a bunch of people. It wasn't just young boys. Like some of these gay priests. Man, when they hate women, they hate women. They made these women miserable at these churches, especially if they worked in the office. It was bad. So anyway, next one is to take the tithe that's supposed to be given to God, and use it to silence people, is stealing from God and from the people who gave their tithe in good faith. That's another thing that really bugged me. It's like you know, I worked hard for my money. I believe in labor. I believe the work of your hands, all that good stuff. Not like always, literally. Like I'm not, I'm not saying you have to dig a ditch, but you know, do a good job at your at your work. And then I'm tithing out of good faith. And then instead of my money going where it's supposed to go, they're just paying people off and not correcting the behavior. I was like, that's a big problem because that's technically misappropriation of funds. Like if it's not right for the Susan B. Komen Foundation to give their donations to Planned Parenthood, then it's not okay for the Catholic Church to take people's tithes 
and use it as hush money to keep victims quiet about what their priests were doing. You know, you have to call a spade a spade. There's no favoritism here. You have to just say it like it is, because if you don't say it like it is, then everything is hidden and it's hushed, and then the bad stuff never gets addressed, and it just perpetuates, and that's not what we want. So these scandals should have never happened, but they continued to happen for several several decades because the Catholic Church did not want to address the homosexual problem taking place in the priesthood. Now, is homosexuality in the priesthood is it only in the Catholic Church? No. It is not. Unfortunately. My experience with it is that I saw it here in Oklahoma and I saw it here in our archdiocese of Oklahoma City. But it's it's nothing new. But that should tell us that people over time have been dropping the ball for a long time and they have not been protecting the church. They have not been living a good moral life. And that is the responsibility of our leaders, our shepherds, and also the adults of the church. I think one of the biggest disadvantages to this is that some of the lay people, especially the adults, they felt like they couldn't speak up. So then the Catholic Church has a knee-jerk reaction, oh, we're going to create a board, we're going to have a, a police officer on our board, we're going to do all this stuff, we're going to have a hotline. I'm like, really? It looks like, you know, too late. The damage is done. Like technically the Catholic Church and other religious organizations, they already have these protocols in place of what to do. And guess what? You get it from God's holy word. And also, you should get it from common sense. Like for example, if you have a child and they're hanging out with your neighbor, your child tells you, "Hey, the neighbor touched me inappropriately." Would you just be okay with that neighbor moving over across the street and never reporting it, never addressing it? No. That bad person touched your child inappropriately. You would handle it immediately. You would report it. And let the appropriate actions be taken place. But unfortunately with the Catholic Church, it's like it's like they don't like to do anything until it's like they really have to do something. Like they do a knee-jerk reaction, they overreact, and I'm like, "Really? So you're going to put a, a police officer on a Catholic board?" Here's the thing. Oklahoma is notorious for locking up people that have not committed crimes. We have one of the highest incarceration rates in the United States. I don't know why, but our our police force is not as good as it could be. So if we've got cops that should not be cops, why in the world would the Catholic Church put a cop on their board to help address the the priest scandals basically? That that's not really what you should be doing. Like my mouth just dropped. Like technically, Christian churches already know what to do. You call that member out on their behavior, and they can't be around you guys anymore. They can't do what they were doing. And if they have broken the civil law, they have to go to civil court. Because even Jesus says, "Obey the laws of the land," especially if it does not interfere with your faith walk. Now, I'll give an example of this. You know, let's say you're, you know, it's Old Testament times, and you're living in a in a pagan <clears throat> living in a pagan territory. Excuse me. Well, if the law of the land says you have to sacrifice your youngest child if you have more than three children, then obviously you cannot obey that law of the land because the civil authority, in that particular instance, does not trump God's law. Because actually, it's breaking God's law. So that's what Jesus meant when he said, "You obey the laws of the land, but you also obey my Father's laws." So God's laws come first. Then you have the civil authority. But unfortunately, what the Catholic Church is doing when they put these police officers on their board or whatever, I think you're inviting trouble in. I really do. Because police officers, they don't always think right. 
Like there is a high rate of domestic violence within families that that where the usually it's the man, the husband is the police officer. It's very common for them to beat their wives and abuse their children, but especially their wives. They beat them to a pulp. We've seen that in the Catholic Church all the time. And I'm just like, and that's what we're putting on our board. Well, certainly not our board. It's the Catholic Church's board of, of certain select people. They play favoritism. So then I'm like, wow. So they're putting their trust in civil authority and not in God. That's what that tells me. I was like, what's the criteria to be on their board to address these issues? Here's another reason why um, I left the church. The Catholic Church, and they taught this um, in one of the classes I attended for converting, and I thought it was odd. And I was like, whoa. There was this teacher that got up there that's not a priest, and I think that they're called RCIA classes. It's the Rite of Christian Initiation for Adults. Only priests should teach that class because we had these one adults get up there. They didn't know what they were talking about. They were all over the place with this. And there was this one woman that got up there. You could tell she had an agenda and it was not for Christ. She had a chip on her shoulder. And she's divorced. And she said that if your husband beats you, you have to stay married. You cannot get divorced. And our class was like, "What?" So then so many people complained to the priest about this. He came in and he said, "No, the Catholic Church is not for abusing women. If you're in a dangerous situation, you need to leave all this stuff." That should have been a, that should have been a big red flag to me. I should not have converted. Because half the class dropped out. I did not because I was like, "Well, it's probably just some nut up there." Like she didn't know what she was saying. "Oh, yes, she did." Because that is truly what the Catholic Church believes. Cuz I've seen women with black eyes and way worse in the Catholic Church because of this. And they don't leave their husbands. And when they do, it's pretty much too late. They've already been beaten really bad. But there is just this mentality, we don't believe in any kind of divorce. I well guess what? The Bible does. The Bible says if your if your marriage is invalid, then you have a right to divorce. Well guess what? If your husband is beating you, then that makes it a very much invalid marriage because he's trying to kill you and murder is not a sacrament it's a sin being cruel and hateful is a sin so you it's it's kind of those things like how can you turn away from something that is bad when the catholic church is embracing and saying oh you shouldn't leave why because you're the woman It's not the man that's getting beaten, it's the woman, it's the wife. I just like, you know, I'm starting to understand why women don't it's like they don't have rights in the Catholic Church. I'm starting to understand it now. So the other thing I was going to mention is instead of defrocking the priests, they moved them from parish to parish or promoted them into positions of power in another state or region. And what I mean by that Like you can have a priest that's just like a regular parish priest and then they might get promoted to vicar general which is it's just a title but they get more power. Then they can be promoted I think I think there's like a position below archbishop. And it's like see it's vicar general then there's like another step I'm probably missing some but then you go to bishop and archbishop and then you can move up to cardinal and then all this stuff they just move them up. So just because someone got promoted that doesn't mean they deserve it and that doesn't mean they're a good moral person especially not in the Catholic Church. Because guess what? It's dominated by men. And they don't protect women. And they don't protect children. Not like they're supposed to. Like once I really started to understand these titles, I was like, "Wait a second. I've heard that guy talk and there's something not right about what he's saying." because it does not line up with the holy word of god. If there's one thing I know is my bible because I live in the bible belt, right? I was like what he's saying does not match up and what he's saying is actually technically heresy and a very dangerous form of doctrine. But yet he's in a position of power. So typically what happens is you have these bishops and these archbishops, not all of them are bad, but not all of them are good. 
So what they do is they create this social media hype and they write these books and it's like we're all supposed to read the same book. And I'm like, "Well, gee, why don't we start with the Bible first? Then read this stuff later." Because here's the thing, if you've read the Bible, then you will know when someone is speaking a lie about Jesus. You will know the truth. And that's why quite a few people did not like me speaking up in the Catholic Church. It was because they liked me questioning these doctrines. I'm like, We're supposed to be vicars of Christ. They're like that's not for women. I was like actually it is. I was like did you know that there were prophets that were women in the Bible? And that some women lived at the temple and in the temple and they worked there? Women obviously have a role in religion. They obviously have a role in the family of Christ. So, part of my stomach is growling cuz it's getting oh, it's not even close to lunch, but it's I I did not eat as much bre- breakfast as I usually do cuz I was trying to eat more fruit. But side note, um, so anyway, the Catholic Church loves to oppress, depress, and repress. Why? For control. And so once I started waking up to that, I was like, you know, it just doesn't feel like I have much freedom in this religion. That doesn't mean freedom to do whatever I want, because that's not what freedom is about. Freedom is not about you know being immoral or amoral or committing crimes. Nothing like that. Having freedom is is what is what you should want from God to be truly free. And I did not feel free anymore in the Catholic Church. I actually felt more free when I didn't practice any religion whatsoever. I mean, I was lost in terms of my soul. And I wasn't really sure what to believe, but I was way happier than I was being Catholic. I was like, you know, I know the Lord wants me to be happy. And I'm just not experiencing true happiness with this. Cuz I feel like I'm constantly trying to live what someone else wants me to do instead of what Christ wants me to do. And I just thought that's not that's not Christ like. Like we are better than this as a society, especially in the United States. Like I'm all for freedom of religion, that's great, but there are some religions they have some problems and the Catholic Church is one of them because they act like a cult. That's what I call them now. I was like it's a cult. because you can always tell if a religion is a religion or if it's a cult and you can you can tell by how they treat their women and their children if women are not seen as equal as men if they're not allowed to speak or if they can't serve in certain roles it's a cult because they are shaming someone based on what sex they were born like islam does the same thing I mean just look at is it Saudi Arabia it's one of those countries over there they have so many human rights violations it's unbelievable I saw this online this is a while ago there was this video there's this woman she was dressed from head to toe covered completely so I knew she must have been Saudi Arabia or somewhere over there and it was obvious she was rich because she had on jewels and so she was in a car I was like what is she doing behind a car like she could be killed like they could pull her out of the car and beat her well She was she and other women had declared that they were going to have the right to drive and this was I don't know a year or so ago because the men over there in the Middle East when they practice the Islamic religion they are very suppressive and repressive of women over there they're horrible to them they're like oh you can't drive it's dangerous for you no they're just trying to control where they go so they can suppress them They can't even go to the the supermarket and buy food without having a male person be there with them. It could even be like here's the thing. A woman can get married, she can give birth to a son, and by the time that son gets to be 12 or 13, he has more rights than her. He's over her. So then he's the one driving the car, yet she gave birth to him. That is unbelievably sexist. I mean, the Catholic Church isn't as bad as that, but it's very similar. and how it views women like we're not treated in a really good way. You know, if anything, Jesus was one of the first ones to lift women up out of the ditch of their status symbol. Cuz mankind had pushed them down to second rate. Eve was not meant or made to be a second rate citizen. She was not. She was equal to Adam. 
It's mankind that suppressed women and made up these rules, laws, and regulations about stuff like that. It's the same thing in the Catholic Church as it is in Islam. Where women are not seen as a value. It's just we're going to tell you what to do all the time. And you know what? Women get sick of that because we have a brain. Anybody would get sick of that. And it's like, you know, if you really want to show someone the goodness of Christ, help them to realize how good they are at their natural skill set and talent and then help them to flourish. Don't suppress them or oppress them. Help them have a good life, not a bad life. But I'm going to get a drink of water and I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. So, that is that part of this lovely episode, but I did want to get that off my chest because I thought, you know, my listeners that they should be told the truth about this. And I thought, you know, we're we're all we're all in this world together. And I, I do believe that we should all try to do our best and be our best. And we should always want better days ahead. And I thought, you know, I I need to correct myself and grow in the happiness of Christ. I thought, well, it's probably best just to lay it on the line and just be honest about some of the things that happened. So that way I can move forward and you know, if someone's listening that those similar things happen to you, I just want you to know I completely understand where you're coming from. And also that I love you very much. And I don't say that willy-nilly. I don't use that word very often. Maybe I should use it more. But I know what it's like to be mistreated and shamed and blamed. And I would not want that in anyone's life. And if anything, I love my listeners. I love you guys very much. Cuz I truly believe that you're very much good-hearted people. And what's neat to me is that I can see when people are listening from different states, I'm like, "Wow, we have so many good people in the United States." So I think it's good to really look outside of ourselves because that that helps me to heal, that it's not all about me and my sorrow, but also that I can share my story that way help break the ice. You know, and have a new dawn, a new day and just help people to not live a life of misery but just know that, you know, the good thing about the past is that's in the past. And that if it still keeps creeping up, then that that's a sign that we haven't addressed something within our own soul and our own heart and that is such a disadvantage to our lives and it's stealing our happiness, it's stealing our joy. And I wouldn't want that for anyone because I don't want that for myself. And I believe in equality and you know, I believe of you know, believe in being of good cheer and doing wonderful things in this world. And it's very hard to be of good cheer if you're still heartbroken about something that happened in the past. It's almost impossible actually to be of good cheer. And I think that's very sad. So, if anything, this is a new dawn, new day. God gives us air in our lungs. He gives us everything. So, if anything, we should keep pushing forward, which is what we're going to do now. So, thank you for listening to all of that. I greatly appreciate you my listeners. You're very kind, sweet. So, um let's go ahead and get started on this uh, particular one. It is the News Guild CWA. It has merged into what well, was News Guild and it merged into the Communications Worker of America, which is the CWA. Um News Guild was founded in 1933. It's headquartered in Washington DC. It it has locations in the United States and Canada, so technically it is an international union. They have 26,000 members. Their president is John, I think it's Schulis, I'm not sure. It's S C H L U E S S. We'll just say President John. And they have affiliations with IFJ and AFL CIO. So let's uh, dive into this puppy. The News Guild CWA is a labor union founded by newspaper journalists in 1933. So this is how when did we enter World War 2? 42. So it's 9 years before um well technically 41 depending on that. But so this is 9 years before we got involved in World War 2, but journalists were very much aware about the fascism that was growing over in Germany. 
like I'm not really sure when they went when the fascists became Nazis, but it was known around the world. It's just people were thinking, well, hopefully it just stays there in Germany and it doesn't spread, which of course it did because it became very hateful and hellbent on killing people, especially the Jews, uh the Jewish population. So then it says in addition to improving wages and working conditions, its constitution says its purpose is to fight for honesty in journalism. Amen. I love that. And the news industry's business practices. The News Guild CWA now represents workers in a wide range of roles including editorial, technology, advertising and others at newspapers, online publications, magazines, news services and in broadcast. And the current president is John, I can't pronounce his last name, so John, I apologize. Uh then we go on a little bit to the history. It says the organization's founders were Joseph Cookman, an editor of the New York Post, Alan Raymond of the New York Herald Tribune, and Hayward Braun of the New York World Telegram. The inaugural chapter was based in Cleveland, Ohio, and Carl Randall was its first director from 1934 to 1940, so still before World War II. It was originally called the American News Newspaper Guild, but simplified its name to Newspaper Guild in the 1970s to reflect the fact that it also operated outside the United States. That's actually really smart because in regards to journalism, what we saw in World War II is that journalism really helped to bring to light what was going on during well before, during and after that war. So newspapers were very much needed and from different press offices located all throughout the planet and in different countries. So that was very important there it's kind of like they they merged in a way um to help society, to help us be aware of what was going on regardless of what side you're on, which of course, you know, we want to be on the good side, but they wanted to at least present the facts to people. It had expanded into Canada in the 1950s. I'm kind of surprised by that. It became affiliated with the American Federation of Labor in 1936, then left to go into the new Congress of Industrial Organizations in 1937 when it expanded its membership to non-editorial departments. It merged with the Communications Workers of America in 1995. The guild is also affiliated with the International Federation of Journalists. The guild has more than 25,000 members in the United States, Canada, and Puerto Rico. Its membership has expanded from just journalists to many other employees of newspapers and news agencies such as clerks who take classified ads and computer support workers. It also represents workers in a number of other industries. In 2015, the union changed its name from Newspaper Guild to its current name, News Guild, to reflect the newspapers aren't the only publishers of news, which is very much true. In 2021, the union changed its logo to reincorporate an I motif from the original logos back to the union's founding and to modernize the look of the union for the future. Now, I have seen the logo, and when I see that I, it reminds me of the Mason's Lodge, which we have discussed in times past. But I don't think that this is cultic. I haven't seen evidence of that. If I had seen that, I would have told you. But I, I don't know if they're just using that symbol, because um. There are a lot of cultures that use that eye as like the all-knowing or all-seeing eye, meaning you you cannot escape the truth is sometimes what that symbol is used for. So that might be a possibility as to why they utilized it. So, let's see here. It talks a little bit go down here. It says on May 18th, 2020, the News Guild launched the Save the News campaign to advocate for local news outlets as part of the federal government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic between January and August 2020 as many as 36,000 journalists had experienced pay cuts, fur- furloughs or layoffs as part of the campaign the group has supported legislative efforts such as S3718 to expand access to the Paycheck Protection Program also known as PPP for local news outlets that have been excluded from it as well as HR 7640 to create tax credits incentivizing subscribing to and advertising in local newspapers. In July 2020, News Guild president President John sent a letter to Senate Majority Leader John, or I'm sorry, sorry, Mitch McConnell, I apologize. <laughs> sent a letter to Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell 
noting his warning, quote, that the local news industry is facing an extinction level event. On April 13th, 2021, more than 600 more than 650 tech workers at the New York Times announced that they were unionizing with the News Guild CWA. In July 2021, the workers filed for union certification with the National Labor Relations Board. On August 11th, 2021, the New York Times Tech Guild held a half-day work stoppage in protest of alleged union-busting tactics from the New York Times management for which the guild filed at least 3 unfair labor practices charges with the NLRB. If the union is certified, it will be the largest union representing tech workers with collective bargaining rights in the United States. The New York Times Tech Guild campaign exists within the broader context of the campaign to organize digital employees also known as Code CWA initiative by the Communications Workers of America to organize tech, game and digital workers in the United States and Canada. I was going to say that reminds me of that previous podcast where we discussed the, um, this union where they want to uh, unionize people that work anything to do with digital or data which I can see the pros and the cons. I just get concerned with um unionizing more and more jobs because it takes away from the private sector. It takes away you having more freedom in the private sector. Like I think a lot of people want unions because they want that security net, almost like social security or disability um in terms of checks and benefits. But see here's the thing. You know, for this example, if you're living off a of social security and or disability, you're not really living your best. You may think that that that's all you can ever get by encourage you. If you are living on social security or disability and or or both, I would encourage you to look into getting a job that pays double or triple what you're getting and just look into having a really good job where you can make really good money so that way you don't have to be on the government's payroll like that where you can actually earn as much money as you want. cuz I would rather want that than just be living paycheck to paycheck cuz sometimes that's what happens with union jobs. You know, like sometimes with union jobs, of course I'm excluding automakers and longshoremen and some of the other people that are way overpaid, but there are a lot of union jobs that they're not paid as well as they could be paid if they just worked in the private sector because a lot of these unions sometimes they they suck the members dry of their union dues and then they don't have the money that they were promised so one way that unions the higher ups within the union the people in leadership the way they get away with that is they say well look at the entire package look at all the benefits well see here's the thing your benefits can amount to one thing but sometimes you might be better off just making way more money and purchasing your benefits on your own cuz sometimes i feel like people they just take a lower paying job just so they can get the benefits. Well, here's the thing. If you're taking a low paying job just to get the benefits, guess what? You still have a low paying job. And I'll give an example. Let's say for example, you're working a job and you make $25,000 a year gross income. Not very much, but at least it's something. But let's say you get really great benefits. Well, let's say those benefits um would amount to maybe you making if you were to get the cash it'd be like 32 or 34,000 a year. So here's the thing because you've taken a lower paying job just for the cushy benefits, quote unquote, you're actually missing out on making way more money. So if you're settling for 25,000 a year, you could actually be making 50,000 if not 75,000 or $100,000 a year regardless of whether you have new benefits with that job or not. So it's kind of like the you have to think of it in terms of ratios. is how I look at, you know, I can take this low paying job and get really good health insurance if they even offer really good health insurance. You know, I can get the benefit package. But, you know, let's say for example, I got a job where I made 85k a year. I mean, what are the odds of getting crappy insurance? Excuse my language. What's the odds of getting horrible insurance with a job that pays you 85k right out of the gate? More than likely, you're going to have really cushy benefits, like way better than our offer to someone that makes 25k a year. Like does that make sense? I hope so. Cuz I've noticed whenever I look for jobs here in Oklahoma because they don't pay as much as in Texas, California and New York for sure. But see here's the thing. If you're looking at a lower paying job, yes you get benefits but it may not be with the best health insurance 
within your territory or within your state that you're in. However, if you're working a job where you make well over 85k a year, the odds of you having not so good health insurance are actually really low because they know that hey, if you're wanting to make more money, we've got to make this seem like an even sweeter deal by giving you access to really good health insurance, really good health benefits, you know, really good life insurance, really good disability insurance, like all this other stuff. Like so what I'm saying is don't cut yourself short just by thinking about joining a union or joining a union like you're actually worth more than you think. And if you want to know how to define that, I would encourage you and I did the same thing for myself, so I'm right there with you. I've made a list of all the jobs I've had over the years, like from the moment I started working, which technically I started working when I was 16 years of age. And so I wrote down every job I've ever had. I wrote down what the title of that job was, if I could remember it, and then I wrote down everything I did at that job. The moment my foot stepped foot on that property and I clocked in, to the moment I clocked out, I wrote down everything. Everything. And so then I started noticing all these skill sets that I have and that that I've been taught over the years. So I'm actually worth way more than what I'm making. So that's why I always tell people always keep a current resume on hand. Like always keep your resume current so that way you you can quickly look for another job if you need more money while you have your current job. So say for example you're currently making $25,000 a year. What I would do if I was in that situation, I would continue to work that job but then apply to jobs where I make 50k a year. And really toot your horn when you go to those interviews. And if they start the phone interview, that's great. You can take that phone call at lunch or on a break or when you get home or first thing in the morning. You know, you, you can negotiate that time. And you you can be in the privacy of your car because sometimes what I would do way back in the day when I had to do a phone interview but I was still working for an employer, I would just take the call at lunchtime and I'd be in the drive-thru at Taco Bell or McDonald's and I would just do the interview right there in my car while I'm on the phone. So that way my employer would not know I was looking for a job, but yeah, I still had the privacy of my car while I'm there eating my lunch in order to make that business phone call because it is business and it's personal. So your employer does not need to know that you're looking for another job and I would never tell them. I would not tell them until you actually get the job offer and there's a there's a firm start date of when you're actually going to start. Because if you tell them beforehand, there's a good chance you're going to lose your job. and then you won't have anything. So you you kind of have to learn how to play the field here in terms of jobs. Maybe that's not the right way to word that cuz that can be worded really wrong, but you have to learn how to play your hand. You know, that's use a poker term instead of a dating term. Um so you have to basically know what cards you have in your hand and don't ever show your hand. Because once you do that, you lose all leverage on both fronts, and that's really sad when you're talking about job growth and opportunity. So again, if you're making whatever salary you're making, times it by 2 or 3 and then apply to those jobs online. That's how I was able to increase my income. Because sometimes we get stuck in a rut and we think, well, all I'm worth is what my employer says I'm worth. That's a lie straight out of the depths of hell. I don't mean to be that blunt, but it, that is true. You are worth way more. Does that mean you walk into your bo- your boss's office and say, "Hey, I'm worth way more than what you're paying me?" No, you you'll be fired. Don't do that. What I'm saying is that you are worth way more than what you get what you're getting paid. I say that so that you know how to look forward to better things in the future. Not so that you can be pompous, arrogant and rude in the moment. And I'm not saying that you are, but I'm just saying that sometimes people will take what they want to hear and then I don't know if the right word is exemplify it or it just kind of overflows into arrogance and pompousness and we don't want to do that. But just knowing what your value and what your worth is in terms of your labor is a negotiating tool, much like these unions. Like you don't have to be in a union to know how to negotiate for your future, for your job, for your benefits. I learned how to negotiate at a young age because I learned real quick I do not want anyone to have their thumb over me. Like I want to be in charge of my labor. Even though I'm working for someone, I am in charge technically of my paycheck whenever I show up to the job and I do my job and I do it well. I mean, I like my employer, I do a good job, I'm very grateful, all those wonderful things, but it's the employee that really needs to know how to negotiate because if you don't know how to negotiate, 
you've kind of thrown in the towel from the get-go. So don't do that. Always kind of be two or three steps ahead of the employer, but not in a crafty way, in a wisdom kind of way, in a good way. Because sometimes whenever I hear people talk about being, you know, two or three steps ahead, they think of it as like a thief does. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not what this is at all. You're trying to better your life, not worsen it. But that also, when you're trying to better your life, that doesn't mean you can put down someone else's. So that's why... You're not shady with them. You're not using any kind of trickery, anything like that. You're just focusing on your skill sets, what you're good at, and what you love to do. Because if you do what you love to do, then you're not going to feel burdened. And you're not going to feel like, man, I could be making so much more money elsewhere. Why am I doing this job? I hate my job. I hate my boss. You, know, you won't be saying those things if you're doing what you love. Because if you're doing what you love, then whenever something tough happens or hardship happens or things get a little... uncertain you won't give up you'd be like well i understand what this is but i love my job i love what i do i love the industry i'm going to i'm going to stick it out i'm going to continue with this as opposed to if you don't like what you're doing you're not likely to stick it through you're you're not sorry my stomach i'm still hungry um you're not likely to continue what you're doing and that's very unfortunate but see here's the thing if you have to leave an industry if you have to leave a job do not look at it as a failure look at it as a stepping stone to something new because again You know, when your current job ends, write down that job title and then write down everything you did at that job because, you know, come one or two years from now, you may not remember everything you did at that job, but it's very important. Because even though that job opportunity ended, it was still a beginning to something else because it is still a stepping stone. So nothing is wasted, nothing is thrown away. Why? Because it matters to you and to your life and it's about your happiness and your future. Is my point. Like don't ever throw away an opportunity to grow, to learn, to be a better version of yourself. That doesn't mean that the current version is wrong or bad. That's not what that means. If someone tells you that, that's a lie straight out of the depths of hell. It that's not what that means. Just know that we can always improve, but you don't improve by degrading. Does that make sense? So cuz that's kind of one of the things I came across in, you know, the Catholic Church was that they they claim they want you to improve your life but yet they degrade you and they think that the way that you get better is by being mean to someone i'm like no that's actually the opposite so it's the same thing in employment sometimes managers and i'll close with this sometimes bosses and managers they think if they want to make someone better they degrade them talk down to them oh well you know this really builds people up no it doesn't it 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 breaks them down And sometimes I've noticed this with military people. Sometimes military people should not work in offices. I've said this before, and I say this out of dignity and respect towards our military. But sometimes you guys, guys and gals, are way too intense for our calm office, because sometimes these people they get in positions of management, and they 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 apply what they learned in the military to civilian life, and that's not how you do it at all. So there was one guy I remember working with. He was a nut. He was a military guy. He was in the Marines. And so he went into working in data IT analytics. He had no business being there. He was too high strung, he was too intense, he was not professional. He was a loudmouth schnook, know it all. He was not good at what he did. Well, his way of handling things was he would break you. He thought that if he broke you down, he could rebuild you the way he wants you. And I'm like, that's military talk. Like we're not fighting a battle. We're not fighting an enemy. We're 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 in civilian mode. We're in the private sector. Like when you break when you break someone down, it's not for you to do that. Like when you break them, you literally break their heart and their soul. That's not right. You're not building someone up. You're you're tearing them down, and that's not good management. That's terrible management. So what this guy thought, his thinking was, well, I'll, I'll just apply what I learned in the Marines. But guess what? Hardly any of us are Marines. So it means we don't have the same toughness in terms of mentality. That doesn't mean we're weak. It just means we don't have the same skill sets. So if someone doesn't have the same skill sets, then you cannot expect them to perform at the same level as what you do. But this guy did not understand that, not at all. He thought that he could break someone down and then rebuild them into what he wants. What's well, like, well, this person wasn't hired based on what he wanted. These people were hired based on who the employer wanted, and it's not for him to break someone spiritually and then build them into whoever he wants because he doesn't know everything. And it's not very kind to treat someone that way. So he had a lot of problems. Needless to say, um I feel sorry for his marriage. I feel sorry for his wife and his kids because I can only imagine the yelling and screaming this guy did. It was just ridiculous. But anyway, um so just know that your life does have value, your labor has value. 
If you're becoming a vet, better version of yourself, that's great. But that doesn't mean the previous version was bad. Not by any means. Just look at it as an upgrade. You know, like whenever you're upgrading your computer and you're and you're downloading a new update, it's just an update. You know, we can always change and do better. And if if you know what, if we if we update into something, as they say. um like a computer and the update doesn't work right just change it just do something different always move forward realize you always have a new opportunity in front of you so always take it as long as my rule is as long as it is legal and moral because if it's not legal or moral you're in for a whole heap of trouble and we don't want that you know we want you to be you know basically happy healthy and whole which is what i pray for all of my listeners of this podcast So but I will go ahead and end it there and the the next one that we will take a look at is the printing publishing and media workers. So that one should be interesting. But until next time, well first of all, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for listening to this podcast. I know it was a little tough in the beginning, but I thank you for sticking with me and for listening to this podcast. I greatly appreciate you and I love all of you very much. So until next time, I pray that you're happy, healthy and whole and that you have a wonderful life and a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.